Now, some of what uh, some of what my job is as a professor isn't just to uh, it's not just to to teach you about science and engineering. Um, sometimes uh, it's important to discuss. Um, some very uh, touching issues that are really important in today's society. Um, it is part of my job to teach you culture uh, and to do so appropriately. So uh, I'm going to quickly switch the live stream feed. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a very important video for today's society. Okay. I promise I won't take up too much of your time here. My name is Andrew Christensen. Uh, I live at 1212 Twin Ridge Road. Lincoln has the opportunity to be a social leader in this country. We have been casually ignoring a problem that has gotten so out of control that our children are throwing around names and words without even understanding their true meaning, and treating things as, as though they're normal. I go into nice family restaurants and I see people throwing this name around and pretending as though everything is just fine. I'm talking about boneless chicken wings. I propose that we as a city remove the... Excuse me, I'm trying to hear you. Excuse me. I propose that we as a city remove the name boneless wings from our menus and from our hearts. These are our reasons why. Number one, nothing about boneless chicken wings actually come from the wing of a chicken. We would be disgusted if a butcher was mislabeling their cuts of meats, but then we go around and pretending as though the breast of the chicken is its wing? Number two, boneless chicken wings are just chicken tenders, which are already boneless. I don't go to order boneless tacos. I don't go and order boneless club sandwiches. I don't ask for boneless auto repair. It's just what's expected. And then number three, we need to raise our children better. Our children are raised being afraid of having bones attached to their meat that's where meat comes from. It grows on bones. We need to teach them that the wing of a chicken is from a chicken, and it's delicious. I propose that we rename boneless wings in the city of Lincoln. We can call them buffalo-style chicken tenders. We can call them wet tenders. We can call them saucy nugs or trash. We can take these steps and show the country that where we stand, and that we understand that we've been living a lie for far too long, and we know it because we feel it in our bones. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So this is a real video. Um, yes. Did anybody see this when it went viral last week? Yeah. Yeah, my nephew was all about this. Um, yeah, this, uh, it's actually this guy's son. Um, and apparently decided that he needed to go entertain his dad at work. Um, of course, this also wasn't the last appearance of this guy either. So, problem is that uh, later showed up. Let me see if I can get the actual video. Oh, it's not here. This one didn't nearly go as viral, but uh Oh, I don't want to see that. Let me just watch that. Here it is. Everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, as you know, Twitter has been... Excuse me. I got this covered. Uh, I got this covered. All right. Your show, Chicken Wing. My name is Andrew Christensen. I like football because I love tailgates. They improve mental health, they stimulate the local economy, and they create lasting memories. But most importantly, tailgates mean wings. 
Just like a wing without a bone is just a saucy nug, a Saturday without Husker football is just a Saturday. I propose that one, we bring college football back to Lincoln. Two, we never tailgate with saucy nugs. And three, you stop calling me Carrot Top because the tops of carrots are green. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Clearly this guy is just using his fame now to, uh, to just be humorous. Um, but uh, now that you understand uh, culture. <laughs> I, see, the thing is, he's only got the, he's got the three points down. Every time he stands up, it's three points. Um, but in any case, now that I have educated you on culture, um, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You needed to know that. Um, all right, so let's get to a real conversation topic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have man. lost so many brain cells that could have been used for education watching those videos. Um, they were funny. I'll have you know, there are a few things in life that are as educational as what I just showed you. We watch videos in this class because we can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, when it comes down to it, when we have to go do the scientific method, one of the requirements for doing the scientific method is that we need to have some kind of background information. Um, going into project one, your project is to uh, do research on non-Newtonian fluids, uh, specifically oobleck, which is a, a strain thickening fluid. And uh, there's a lot of questions you can ask. The obvious question is, what is it? Um, that seems a little bit too broad. If, you, if the research question you want to ask is, how does it work? What is it? Where does it go? Um, there are already people who have done research on that. There are already people who have asked those questions. There are already people who have published answers to that everywhere. So when it comes to getting information, we need to, and asking the question, um, the reason why when I presented the scientific method to you, I paired ask a question and do scientific research and background research is because they do kind of go hand in hand. Uh, anytime you go to do any kind of scientific research, you're not gonna know everything. Uh, hopefully not anyways, otherwise there's no reason to ask a question. Yeah. Um, you, you have to have some element of curiosity there. And there are already going to be tens, hundreds, thousands, potentially even millions of people who have already asked the question that you're asking right now. And for you to go in there and say, well, nobody else has ever asked this, I'm just going to jump into research, is for you to say, I am going to do some study over something that everybody already knows. Why do tables stand upright? Why do people have cell phones? I'm gonna do research over that. Or the two point some million dollar study that they put into why do coffee rings show up on cups? Like, okay, that's not really gonna be beneficial to society. I don't know why they spent two million dollars of government research money to figure that out, but they did. And nobody's lives have been better as a result. So $2 million wasted. Oh, that's where all our tax money goes. That's where all your tax money goes. Studying coffee. You know a lot of people put down cups of coffee during that research study. Coffee's important. For some people. For people like me, it's Mountain Dew. Um, get out of my class. Just leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> uh, let's, uh, oh man, you guys got me distracted now. I was on a roll. In any case, you will have some people who have already asked your question. And for you to say, this is an important way for me to spend my time and energy, well, it's not. 
if somebody has already verified that something is true and has verified that there is knowledge available, when you go to do a scientific study over it, you're basically just reinventing the wheel all over again. Okay? Um, for those of you who are engineers, uh, if I were to sit down and say, hey, design a good mechanical pencil, there might be one of you who could come up with an idea that was revolutionary and that changed the mechanical pencil market. Uh, that likelihood is very, very small because there's a, probably 10, 15, 20 different kinds of mechanical pencils you can buy on the market right now. And all of them have been vetted and tested. They put together different configurations. You know, this is something that has been well studied. So for you to try to take on something that has been well studied and try to reinvent it again, it's challenging. Mechanical pencils are cheap. They're easy to redesign. You can come up with one on your own, great. But it's really rare. Similar for the scientific method. If you're going to study something that somebody else has already studied and asked your exact question, and you're going to follow an exact procedure that somebody else already did, you may learn something they didn't know. But more than likely, you're going to end up just doing, just walking through the steps again. You're going to get the same information they got. You're not really going to gleam anything out of it. So doing scientific research, one of the critical aspects is that you ask a question, but that you know your question is relevant. And that hopefully your question hasn't been well answered yet. You may read five papers that have something to do with your question, but if you do not understand those five papers well enough, or you feel like they didn't explain themselves well enough, that's grounds for going ahead and doing research. There are tons of people who do research over again because the research that exists may not make a lot of sense or may not have focused on it or may have had some confounding variables. When I was in grad school, I did a bunch of research on, uh, on the, the motions of walking. Now, walking motions have been studied for over a century. Uh, there are entire journals dedicated to just talking about walking. So for me to say, I'm going to revolutionize walking study, was a little stupid. Now, everybody has dreams that their science is going to be greater than everybody else's, but uh, my revolutionary style was that I decided to track certain mechanics and then try to model them mathematically. Uh, was it super revolutionary? Eh, probably not, but it did give a very interesting way for me to model walking. That's about it. Um, and what I, the research that I did was useful because it enabled me to come up with the foundations of a database. Uh, but that's about it. I spent a lot of work trying to recreate a wheel. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up going and finding other people's data sets because they already existed. And I ended up finding other people's research. And I ended up putting things together and coming to realize that most of the people doing research were focused on the wrong elements of it. And by doing so, by doing my background research, I adjusted my question and I was able to address a unique aspect of walking that hadn't really been studied very, very well before. In a good research project, you'll do something similar. It's not just the statement of, I'm going to throw a question out, and then I'm going to do some research, and then I'm going to continue doing that exact same question. You adjust your question to be more relevant, to use the information that you now know, and you come up with a better research question. You come up with a more specific research question. So what we're going to be doing as the first part of this project, kind of the kickoff of this project, is I'm going to want you to find a partner to do your project with. Okay? You and one other person are going to be doing this Ublek project. you got to find out who. I would exchange names, exchange email addresses, exchange numbers. Everybody needs to find a partner, and we're not going to continue until everybody has a partner. So, go ahead. Yep, go right now.
Okay, I know that there's at least one person who's absent from class today. So, yes. And if, if we can't find somebody, then I'll put you in a group with somebody else because we do have an odd number here today. So you will have a partner. What's that? I said I'm just going to have my Unfortunately. Not really. Well, it's weird being odd. Not really. Mm -hmm. It's just nicer being even. That one I can agree with. Odd numbers. Unless they're multiple shows. That's true. I can deal with that. I do like, yeah. It's the prime numbers that get me. Dang you, odd prime numbers. Just the fact that they can consistently discuss one another without using any sort of division. Mm -hmm. But because it's just not easy. Right. And it's just like, there's no way to divide it. Okay, um, while you are continuing to get to know each other, uh, I'm going to go ahead and continue on with our lecture. Um, so on the topic of information and doing background research, uh, it, it's really important that you vet your information. When you do background research, you can get information from just about any source. What's the first thing you do when you don't know something? Look it up on, you Google it. Ugh. Ugh, didn't I already kick you out once? We don't use those, that's, that is disgusting words. That is not appropriate in this kind of setting. Ugh. I can't even repeat it, it's that bad. See, Firefox is fine. It's just that, that IE word, ugh. Okay, it's actually Microsoft Edge now, is that better? No. Microsoft Edge is like what happened when somebody was like, hey, I have this piece of trash. I'm going to give it a new name and try to sell it. And then force it on your computer. You know what? At least Microsoft Edge recommends videos to me as soon as I open the browser. That's creepy. It makes it easier to not be you still said Internet Explorer. And then you made me say it. I'm going to have a bad afternoon because of that. <laughs> the only oh. thing Internet Explorer is good for is for downloading Google. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Every time, every time I, I open up Microsoft Edge and immediately download both Firefox and Chrome. Um, in any case... So let's say we're going to start on this project. You don't know anything about this. We're going to say, hey, I want to ask a question about, um, you know, I got a question about non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to look up Ublack. Okay, let's see. The first one is a, a Dr. Seuss science experiment. Um, it's, okay, that looks, I mean, it's from Scientific American. There's, there's some, uh, oop, I better... Better show the live stream my video. Um, that's Scientific American. There's there's some knowledge there to be dropping. Uh, look, there's Wikipedia. I've heard that's a super awesome source. Um, here's a, here's an Imagination Station Toledo.org. Um, how many of these sources are geared towards you, the intellectual? All. All of them. Every one of them is applicable. Um, hold on, we could check out this book that's on the right side, Bartholomew and the Ublek. This is probably something you should cite in your research paper. Um, uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to when it comes to scientific sources, if you're looking for a good scientific question, um, just doing a quick. Google search over Ublek isn't really giving you the stuff that you need. Now let's let's go a step deeper. Let's say okay, um, let's say we read uh, 
we read this Scientific American article and we're like, oh, look, this, oh, sick. Oh. <laughs> ah. Yeah. We're going to have to use food coloring. Yeah. Um, in any case, uh, this then gives you a recipe for it. And then it slightly explains it. And then tells you how to clean up. Which, I mean, is nice. You're probably not going to find any scientific papers on cleaning up oobleck. But, but again, I mean, whatever. Um, so maybe, maybe in all this research, you realize that this has been a big, big waste of your time. Um, you're going to look up non-Newtonian fluids. Okay, the first thing that pops up is Google Scholar. How many of you used, have used Google Scholar before? I've heard of it, but I've never got a chance to use it. Google Scholar is, let's, let's go down that rabbit hole. Okay. Ooh, agitation of non-Newtonian fluids, 1957 paper. Loving it. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, this is nice. I only get an abstract. And I, I can join, uh, I'm, uh, ooh, I can spend money. I'll, I'll pay 500 bucks and join ALCHE. Sweet. No, you know what? I, I don't really want to spend the money and I have no other way of getting this paper. It won't even let me download it. Oh, wait, there's PDF. <gasps> oh. All right, who wants to spend eight bucks? <laughs> no. No, I'm good. Okay, so, so that... That, that didn't quite work out. Let's go to the next one. Um, ooh, 1982. This, that's a pretty good year. It's delicious. Good year for science. Um, I'm just going to jump in here. and Now we're going to talk about a note on unsteady unidirectional flow of a non-Newtonian fluid. So, um, resume. On epitilitat de solaciones exactas por un ensemble. Ooh, foreign class, Nixon Steiner. I cannot do that. <laughs> I always wanted to learn German. Um, I probably just offended everyone on the internet. So tell your friends, I'll get fired. I should not try to read this. Who can you not offend when you're on the internet? It's true. I offend myself mostly. So let's say I actually want to read this article and, and the English version of it. Um, oh, I'm going to go up here and click get access. Uh, oh, this actually gives you the option to find it at Doan. Nice. Um, if you're not at Doan and you're not using Doan's IP address, uh, it doesn't do that for you. It doesn't just do that to everybody in the world. Ooh, I don't know fun this that don't. Um, so it actually does use your IP address to figure that out. But still, here now we've had two different articles, just the top two, uh, we can't really get access to. You may be able to find a few of these that you can get access to. Um, but a lot of times this won't really give you that good of access to the information that you want to get. Um, Google Scholar has a lot of papers has a lot of references to papers. If you really like reading abstracts, um, it's beneficial. Um, but this also tends to be really deep. If you, we just read the, let's read the uh, abstract of this one, okay? So this is an overview of the analytical and experimental hydrodynamics and heat transfer studies of Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids in laminar and turbulent flow through rectangular tubes. How many of you recognize what we're discussing here? I recognize about 80% of it. We got one. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. What kind of teacher? That's weird for a physics teacher to like laminar flow that much. 
That's, I mean, that's cool. Boy, that's, you know, when I usually ask a question, nobody says yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but congratulations on actually knowing this. You're in a great place when it comes to, to fluid dynamics. Um, yeah, most of this is, it's, it's just like, look, I'd have to go look up what does, what does laminar mean? What is turbulent? What, what is hydrodynamics? What is heat transfer? I mean, you just, you walk through all these things and it's like, okay, now I have no idea what most of these definitions are. This can be really, really deep. Okay, so when it comes to, to going down the Google Scholar route, uh, the issue with Google is you tend to get stuff that's made for kids or people who don't really understand the topic. Okay, which may be you, so it may be a great place to start. <laughs> Problem with Google Scholar is you may not have access to the resources, and then what the heck? It's made for people who understand the language. Okay? If I'm searching for non-Newtonian fluids, and I'm somebody who does research in non-Newtonian fluids, so I pretty much already know it, this will give me a good list of hopefully recent publications. You can actually sort it by date. You can. Uh, you can sort it by the different kind of journals that they come from, and you can do a lot of research that way. It is a good resource. But we kind of need something that goes in between this and this to work with us. Uh, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. So I sent out an announcement on Canvas. Uh, if we go to announcements. And this is the link to the Doan Library Research Guide. Um, this is the link to the Doan Library Research Guide. Uh, this is specifically set up for engineering. Um, we also use it in physics. It's just called engineering, but whatever. Uh, basically, this was set up by the library uh, at the wishes of our department. Um, got to work with uh, Callie. I don't know what her last name is anymore because she got married. Biagi. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. I've already offended too many people today. Um, but it was set up by her because she, uh, well, she and I and our department uh, really wanted to, to try to streamline this process. Okay, Doan spends a lot of money every year trying to get access to those resources that you do not have access through uh, through Google Scholar. Uh, there are literally hundreds of thousands of journals, uh, potentially even millions of journals, that have been published worldwide, uh, even just within the last 50 years. And to try to find every single one of those journals and try to find every single paper that has been cited in those journals, is it's a very expensive process when most of those journals uh, are hidden behind, you have to pay for them, you have to subscribe to them, you have to have some kind of ownership to it. Uh, it, it becomes cumbersome to find information. Uh, as a scholar, your best resources for finding information almost always will be a university. Most universities um, are on the cutting edge ground of, of research because they have this kind of of background knowledge. They have the ability to go look up these things. Whereas if in a non-university uh, setting trying to, to have extensive databases like this available to them is extraordinarily expensive. Very challenging. You get these resources for asterisk free. Um, it does come with your fees and your tuition that you pay at down. Uh, but they go into the fact that now you can go find information. And this isn't Google search, free stuff that you can get for kids. Uh, this isn't Google Scholar stuff where, where you sit around and say, what the heck. Um, this is, it's more relevant. Uh, in my life as a research professor, being able to do research, um, I have found that this resource has been very helpful for me. 
Uh, and this is something that I actually do use myself. So do I know it would have some value to you? Yes. And that's why we're talking about it. So step three is down library resources. Now, I'm not going to say that this is perfect. I'm not going to say it's the most extensive ever. Uh, but this, this should be on your list of things that you look at whenever you go do research. Okay, and that is why I've provided you the list, the link to this uh, site. And I will encourage you to use this. Now, some of the best just resources that are immediately available to you involve access engineering, which we'll talk a little bit about, and the technology collection. So here if I pop open access engineering, this is a McGraw-Hill resource that was specifically made uh, as a collection of textbooks. Uh, yes, we do use this access engineering resource in our curriculum heavily, not only because it means you can get free access to some of these PDFs, uh, but it also means that you can go and you can do research in topics that you may not have a lot of interest in. Um, now, I'm a nerd. Um, I read textbooks for fun. And part of the reason why I like reading textbooks is because it allows me to dip my hands in the water of topics I don't really understand very well. Rather than going to a journal paper, which is discussing potentially cutting edge research in a certain topic, uh, going into a textbook, textbooks tend to be uh, a lot more general. Textbooks are the step between Googling it and actually reading journal papers. Um, if you read a good textbook and you understand the textbook material, you should be able to then turn around and read journal papers. That's the progression. Um, so I do like the fact that you have a bunch of textbooks available to you here. Let's go ahead and search for non-Newtonian fluids. And uh, takes a little bit. But now what you have is, here's a chapter in a book on the handbook of heat transfer. Here's a chapter in a book on fluid flow. Here's a chapter in a book on piping calculations. Here's a chapter in a book on fluid film lubrication. And you can keep going and there are multiple applications for studying uh, non-Newtonian fluids. Now if we want to study non-Newtonian fluids as a part of plastics or plastic behaviors, we'll click on this one. Let's say, you know, we have some interest. And then, uh, yeah, just flow behavior of a real fluid. Ooh, it's British or Canadian. <laughs> Duncan, what's with your quips today? You're on your game. <laughs> uh, basically just talking about how shear stress versus shear, which is force versus displacement on a, on a molecular level, uh, how those are related to each other. Okay, and here's, here's a bunch of different relationships that can exist. There's Newtonian. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Now, if you really wanted to read through all of this, be my guest. This may be a little heavy. It probably is, but um, you could be doing as much studying as you want over polymer morphology. Yeah, this will probably even tell you what that means. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but I don't need to know because I can read the textbook and I'll figure it out. And if I can't figure it out, I'll go to an earlier chapter. But let's say instead of going for polymers, um, let's see if we can find a source that makes a little bit more sense. You know what? I'm going to go with fluid flow. Oh, I don't want to do that. Where's the other fluid flow one? Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, there it is. So this is a whole chapter just on non-Newtonian fluids. It's on fluid flow. And this looks like it's using language that I can kind of understand. Look, it said the word pharmaceuticals. 
and cosmetics. Isn't this a class where I mentioned the colonoscopy? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Cosmetics. <laughs> now we've gotten the true full spectrum. Um, here it goes into definitions. There is some math involved. Um, talking about shear stress, shear rate. You can read all through this. You really want to know a lot about non-Newtonian fluids. This would be an excellent resource. It would be extraordinarily comprehensive. This is very deep, yes, but you can still try. Um, when you take fluid transfer, this will probably make a lot more sense. Also, when you study mechanics and materials, which will also make this make a lot more sense. Uh, but in any case, this is a resource that's available to you. Um, it's definitely not as heavy as Google Scholar, and it is definitely a step above just Googling it. If you were to cite a source like this, in any professional paper, this is acceptable. Uh, now that said, if you're publishing brand new research and you're using a textbook, sometimes that's often shunned because this isn't technical enough. A textbook is a summary of research that is being done or has been done. Now oftentimes these textbooks will themselves have references and if you basically just run down to wherever the references are, and you say, okay, I'm gonna quote this reference that they used to cite that information that I cited from this source. This is acceptable. Those are all professional resources that you can use. So, when it comes down to it, why is this kind of a source acceptable? And if I go back and I say, okay, um, Let's see, I did, uh, 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 here's Steve Spangler Science. Why is, why is that resource o not, uh, is okay in a scientific paper, but I can't quote Steve Spangler Science. Ooh, Magic Tree 5 pack. No way. <laughs> Glitter bug lotion. Yes. So why can't I use this as a resource? This has useful information. I can scroll down here to the bottom and oh, it just looks like snot. I can look down here at the bottom and it, and I mean it uses a very professional word here. See, it's got gooeyness right there. Okay. So, um, <laughs> why is why is this not the best resource to use in a scientific paper? Whereas if I go over here to the textbook, um, rheological equations from molecular network theories from transactions of soak, real. Which I'd have to look up that journal because I don't know what that is. Um, here's the American Society of Chemical Engineers, Chemical Engineering Journal. Um, why, are, why are these sources okay, but Steve Spangler Science is not? I'm going to go with him. They probably say viscosity instead of gooiness? I don't know. Gooiness is pretty technical. <laughs> yeah. Probably because the Steve Spangler Science website actually had a cart for buying stuff. That's a point that I made in this morning's class. What is the purpose of this site? Self so, study. So. It is to sell you things, okay? If Steve Spangler wanted to tell you that Ublack is the key to happiness, Steve Spangler can. Nobody's gonna stop Steve Spangler. And the people who are gonna fact check him are gonna be like, ah, he's just trying to sell you stuff. So he's promising you the world. Also, I mean, look at that Magic Tree 5 pack. Hot dang. <laughs> um, this, this is not to inform you. The purpose of a journal is not to make money. Even though, yes, they do make some money. So it's not a ton of great money, but they do make money. The purpose of a journal is to inform you. The purpose of a textbook is actually to sell you something. But they do try to inform you. So when it, when it comes down to it, this kind of source is not being vetted for its information. 
Its information exists. It's kind of a secondary clause. Now, this does have good information. I've read through the bottom of this. Steve Spangler's done some work, even though he does use the word gooiness. He does mention non-Newtonian fluid. He talks about viscosity changes. He talks about releasing pressure and its pressure's influence. Um, he then provides some, well, links to things you can buy, uh, which that, that devolves quickly. Um, anyways, but this, it's, there is some useful information here. And if I wanted a free check and just, just quick Google it, look through this, read through this, buy stuff, play with it myself, eat it, I don't know. Um, I put things in my mouth. Uh, it is. It's just also, it feels like something you would never want to put in your mouth. Blech, blech, this gooiness that I have. Um, when it comes down to it, you have to have reliable sources. So I would like for you to use Doan's library resources. Uh, let's go back and check out some of the other resources. Oh, we also talked about the technology collection here. Um, technology and science are fundamentally interlinked. That's something we're going to discuss when we get closer to engineering. Um, but most of our science has been done to advance technology. Uh, and a lot of people who develop technology simultaneously develop science. The touch capacitive screens that are on cell phones were originally designed to make money for Apple. And they did. But they also taught us a lot about touch capacitive systems, which are important. So just because it was a technological development doesn't mean it wasn't also engineering. Similarly, just because it was engineering doesn't mean it wasn't a technological, scientific development. Okay, so this does have some information. I'm not as familiar with this one, but you can look through it. I don't have time to go through it anymore. Um, so this is just the front page. has some quick links. This also does have Google Scholar and Google Patents. Um, every once in a while, if you really wanted to know more about non-Newtonian fluids, you could search for patents that have been used with non-Newtonian fluids. You could find applications of how it's been used in technology that way, which is beneficial. Okay. Um, other handbooks and encyclopedias. Uh, again, it just references this. Um, sometimes if you need to go in and you need a refresher on a certain topic, uh, you can look this up. This is kind of like a dictionary for terms. Um, you want to learn about airplanes? Uh, that's great. Learn about algorithms? Also pretty great. Uh, you can just look up some terms if you're having difficulty with definitions. That's another resource. Uh, here's some resources that are specific to different disciplines of engineering. Um, that's just more engineering stuff. But, um, standards, technical reports, and patents. Um, those aren't things that we're going to be getting into in this class as much. Um, a standard is, is basically a law for, or it's basically a regulation on uh, how a process is done, how a piece of technology is made, uh, that kind of a thing. We're not really going to get into that in this class. That's, that's a bit heavy. Um, some books and journals are available. Uh, here you can search the Doan catalog. You can search through the different journal databases. These are the three that are recommended for you. Uh, most of everything you need to know you could find in these three collections. Uh, if you start looking through those three collections, that'd be great. Um, you can also watch this informative video on how to do how to search in a database. So that's fun. Other web resources that are available. Um, is there different associations and societies that are relevant? Uh, and then we've got, apparently there are also videos. Which I don't watch videos. I never do. We don't watch videos. No. It's gross. No, no, absolutely not. No, this is a completely professional. Entirely educational. Uh, lastly, this tab on writing and citing. We are going to get to know this in a couple weeks. Uh, I think actually maybe, yeah, two weeks from now. So, all right, let's talk about your assignment. So if I go back to here, 
The assignment that I posted on Canvas is you have a research question. And your research question, I don't actually know how this looks for you. I don't know the, my side of it. Your research question is, you gotta post a research question. Come up with a question, how are you going to study Ublak? Okay, spend some time thinking about it. Spend some time doing some research. You will have to create an annotated bibliography over topics that you're studying about non-Newtonian fluids. I'll give you that information in a later date. But you will have to come up with an annotated bibliography. Start doing some research. Get your feet a little wet. Learn some things that people know about non-Newtonian fluids. And try to figure out a question that you think would really help you out if you, you know, this would be a really interesting thing to study uh, when we go to do our experiment. Okay, also, write the name of your partner, which you're not gonna be able to do because you don't have a partner yet. So, uh, just write that you don't have a partner in that case. <laughs>